Hello, everyone. Welcome to the I Have No Idea What I'm Doing podcast. This is a podcast about business and money for African women. I'm your host, Paula Rogo, checking in from Kenya. Today is July 28th, 2020. The podcast is really the one thing I'm always looking forward to. I'm excited that you're here. So thank you for listening. I do not take that lightly. A quick announcement before I jump into our interview for today. Last week on the I Have No Idea What I'm Doing Instagram page, which is at African Women in Biz, check it out. Um, On the Instagram page, I did a survey on my stories asking about women and money. So this survey specifically asked If you, you women, you listener, have deep discussions with your women friends, your girlfriends, your best buddies about money, do your best female friends, do they know like what, how much money you make? Do they know your money goals if you have any? Do you even share like savings tips, investment tips? Do you guys talk about money was my question. The results of that survey was actually quite interesting. I found that 61% of you said no. So no, you do not have deep conversations or even frequent periodic conversations with your female friends or women friends about money. And then, of course, 29% of you said yes. So 61 said no, 29% said yes. And I found that very interesting. I'm going to take that survey and probably expand on it for my next Money Matters episode next month. So look out for that. Thank you to all of you who filled out this survey. I think I'll be doing more of those quick Instagram story type surveys and turning them into potential episodes or things you could use. So definitely give me a follow at African Women in Biz if you'd like to participate or see the kind of chats we're having on that side of of the digital space so the link to the instagram is in the show notes check it out and give me a follow and now that that's out of the way i am energized to drop today's interview some quick background when i recorded the first season of this podcast it was at the end of 2018 so december 2018 It was supposed to be a limited series podcast, one season about women in business, that's it. But soon after it came out, I realized, you know what, I think I want to keep going with this podcast. Actually, by early 2019, I'd started recording interviews and episodes with other women entrepreneurs. And throughout the year, even though I I didn't find the time to actually edit and put anything out, I was actually still talking to a lot of women. So I have this beautiful catalog of episodes from smart, ambitious women. Over the next few weeks, I'll also be releasing those episodes. And they are just different in that they're not current to today. So please subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen, and you'll be hearing those episodes over the next few weeks. And the first of those episodes is actually today. If you love to eat out and be out and about in cute restaurants and cafes in Nairobi, Lava Latte is the ultimate place to be. Last September, I sat down in the studio, actually, when we could still go to studios with the co-founder of Lava Latte, Abba Arunga, to talk about how she and her partners were able to create a cool, authentically Kenyan cafe. Lava Latte is not just a coffee shop. It's a coffee shop with personality. It's dripping with personality. You can go in for a cup of coffee or a dawa and then end up staying because of the series of amazing events that they're always holding there or there's a friend that you're running into. It's one of those places that feels like your local pub mixed with just great events, good energy, and it's actually aesthetically pleasing. So I spoke to Abba, who is the co-founder, like I said, and what I love about her story and the story about Lava Latte is that she and her team are just action oriented. There's so many things they didn't know about the restaurant business, but they're still here today because they figured it out and quickly pivoted whenever they ran into issues. And 
in my conversation with Abba today, who is actually extremely funny, we talked about what it takes to find the right location for your business, why it's important to build a coffee shop for Kenyans. This was really important to her how she navigates the male-dominated restaurant industry as a woman. And finally, we go into her hopes for expansion of Lava Latte, and they are very, very big goals. Abba really embodies the name of the podcast. I have no idea what I'm doing, but let me tell you, she definitely figures it out along the way. So thanks again for tuning in, and here is my interview with Abba Arunga of Lava Latte. And Abba is here with me in the studio today. Thank you so much, Abba, for being here. Thank you for having me, Paula. I'd love to hear about how the idea of the business even first came together. I've always been interested in like eateries and coffee shops because hanging out around good food is like the best form of entertainment. Mm -hmm. But specifically for Lava Latte, me and my co-founder Kagure actually traveled to Senegal end of 2016. And it was excellent. It was a really great time. And there was this cafe called Layu Cafe Mm -hmm. uh, in Dakar. That was, that's really great. It's like quaint. It had a bookstore and had like a boutique. It was just a really nice space to hang out. And we returned there quite a couple of times during our two week stay. And we jokingly, like one day as we were having coffee there, we're like, you know, we should, we were both planning to go to grad school in 2017. Mm -hmm. And we're like, it would be so cool if we could have a coffee shop like this where we'd be doing like our employment work. Yes. <laughs> and grad school assignments. Right. And we were, then we're like, you know what? We should open one. Like, why? what What would it actually take to have open one? And we're like, oh, yeah. It why was kind not? of like as a joke, but okay. like, but then we got excited and we're like discussing the ideas of what version of coffee shop we'd probably be opening. And we're like, yeah. okay, when we go back to Kenya, let's like discuss it and open a coffee shop. So, okay. Uh, so, ma'am, you have, you're about to start school. <laughs> yes. You haven't even started, right? And then you're like, started. so maybe this was like a trip before your last hurrah. Yes. school takes over. It was the last time we could get that much time off of work and school. And, and then you're like, ha, huh, let me start a business. Uh, in hindsight, how does it sound to you? So it was a bit crazy, but yeah. we were also, I think, both underestimating what it would actually mean, but yeah. also allowing ourselves to, because they're like, if we overthink it, we probably yeah. wouldn't do it. So let's Fair. just... But we had underestimated the amount of time and whatever we'd need with resources we'd have for that. Yeah. So it ended up taking a year before we actually restarted the discussion yeah. and got on to got you know, on working to on the project. So this is twenty sixteen you're in Senegal. Yeah, we're closing out twenty sixteen. And then twenty seventeen you twenty seventeen we start school in January. Okay. We both end up way too busy. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> and just with managing being full t- full full time employment and that and we're both in like pretty like hectic corporate jobs at the time. Yeah. And so the whole year literally disappeared and it was in December and Kagura called me and she was like, So do you remember when we discussed opening a coffee shop in yeah. Senegal? So I still want to stay. do it. Would yeah. you still like to do it? And I was like, Sure. I would, yeah. 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 So, and by that time, also, it had been a week of a year of school, so you've kind of gotten into it, and they're like, yeah. okay, we can probably manage it better now. Uh-huh. Yeah. When does a coffee shop actually open? September 2018. Okay, so that's nine months, yeah, more or less, of yeah. planning and pulling it all together. What was that process like? So. I am not from this industry and I hadn't had experience in it. And everyone always says, you know, location, location is always the most important thing, blah, da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. And we knew that, but we didn't realize just how difficult it would be, especially in Nairobi, when you balance the cost, the access to the people you want, the competition around. For those nine months, three quarters of it was spent finding a space. And then we found it and then we had like two months to set up the shop. So you were quick. We didn't find our space until June. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. And yeah. you saw many different spaces. Oh, we saw a ton of spaces and there's okay. so many beautiful houses. So the, there was all these like concepts where we wanted like a place with a big garden. So we're looking at all these bungalows and there were so many cute ones. But hindsight, I'm so glad some of the ones we were really in love with that mm-hmm. it didn't work out mm-hmm. because rent can be really steep. 
in yeah. the city. Yeah. And that would have been something that would have probably ended up messing us up from very early on and yeah. put a lot of strain in the focus of like everything just trying to go towards that. Yeah. Some of the places that we really wanted were probably like four times the rent that we ended up getting. Okay. Which would have been ridiculous. So you're yeah. located, and I love it, yeah. on State House Road. Yeah. At the former Hillcrest yes. School. Yeah. I read somewhere that you'd seen the place before because I'm, I've actually never considered what it would be like to have a brick and mortar location. So mm. what was it about this location that got the final yes? The location has a lot of film and photo studios. So I have a friend who's in marketing as well who was doing like some photo shoot for work over there. And she was, like, she was just like, it's really cool that it, it lo- feels like a high school. So it sounded as weird as the kind of place we'd probably want. And I was like, oh my God, it would be really cool if you're like in a high school sort of space and there's all these like film studios around. But then, so some of the person who was assisting us went and shared pictures and it, you know, it looked terrible yeah. was the main thing. Okay. And it looked dark and too small. And we were looking at these giant bungalows that were like a <laughs> quarter acre land. Mm-hmm. And so it was just like, no, that won't work. And we kind of just benched it immediately. Yeah. And then after looking at so many other places and starting on leases that ended up not working out for one reason or another, let's now... We have to be more creative. We can't be looking for the finished product. Right. So we need to be open to which space can we adjust and turn into what it is that we what it is that we want it to be. Yeah. So we're like, okay. Yeah. So this place that we turned away in March. Let's actually all go and see it and not just in pictures and see how we feel about it. And the main thing there was like the relationship with the landlord, you know, he was open to us, like making a lot of alterations in the space, which was the, a big problem in a lot of the other places. And it was, it was smaller, but we're like, okay, if we do just our contracting work well, it'll yeah. look super cute. And, and it does. It does, it doesn't does. it? It's yeah. great. It yeah. took longer yeah. to set it up, yeah. but it worked really well. Yeah. It wasn't the ideal space when we started. Also made us put way more work into thinking through exactly how we want this place to look. And we put ourselves a lot more into how the space ended up turning out, Mm -hmm. which I think in the end, like our kind of brand identity and the vibe that we created came out because of that. And that like is what would... You know, as we open 50 million other chains in the future, yes. it's kind of what we'd want to keep. Mm-hmm. So there was serendipity there too. It wasn't all just like, oh, we were so great at finding a place. It yeah. was also the universe assisted us along in the process. So if you had to sort of like two pieces of advice you'd give to someone who's looking for brick and mortar locations, what would they be? In all of your business classes, you're going to be told location is like the most important. thing. It is actually the most important thing. And yeah. you should set aside enough time mm. to be able to do that and go visit them yourself physically mm-hmm. so there's a lot of literally you know multi- multiple trips every week for mul- many months and as you're viewing the location check the relationship with whoever is managing or the mm-hmm. landlord of the place because that's going to like seriously impact how you're going to be running your business over so there so check with like other people who rent from it the people who rent over there meet the person who's mm-hmm. actually the you know the decision maker over there and see how it is Mm -hmm. what kind of person are they and does it do they does your vision and what are your plans are do they seem aligned to it Mm -hmm. and will it be an issue later or also if you just think off the top of your head the Mm -hmm. ideal place probably which it still is Mm -hmm. to set up a place would probably be like in Westlands on this street and da 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 da. <laughs> yes. If you're so locked on that exact thing, yeah. you're blocking yourself from be like open. ways of differentiating yourself probably. So mm-hmm. just look, be open mm-hmm. and allow yourself to be able to like transform a space other than like getting it exactly how you want it. Awesome. Yeah. And so what I love about La- Lava Latte, <clears throat> if anyone has been there, it is vibes dot com vibes, vibes wow that's vibes. my role there yes, actually it, actually on the website it's the says, vibes creator <laughs> vibes so creator. i'm glad you like the vibes <laughs> and what is your brand what is your identity and i know you guys thought this through very specifically but it's what is the at our time. Yeah. so it was kind of, it's a mesh of like a, a working space that you need to you can feel comfortable working all day on your thesis or whatever work yes. stuff you have <laughs> yes and but also like a inspiring and creative space that mm. creative people feel comfortable in mm. and it's entertaining and it's cool mm. and interesting looking mm. i think for us it was There are a lot of boutique coffee shops that have opened in the past like two, three years. But it was also kind of give it the feel of being locally owned because a lot of the other spaces that have opened up in the city are owned by foreigners. And so it it also affects the Mm -hmm. aesthetic, aesthetic, the the client base and all of that. So we wanted a place that's 
also feels very Kenyan mm-hmm. and that Kenyans feel like that the, it was being created for them and for the people us. who are welcome over there yeah. even though you know of course whoever is in the city foreigners visitors whatever cool mm-hmm. we are also of course super welcome yeah. but like it, it it's it's a very Kenyan space as yeah. well yeah. yeah I like that yeah. you have how many partners so it, when I was doing my research mm-hmm. I counted this yourself plus mm-hmm. three other people you guys are managing partnerships as a business mm-hmm. and I really want to get into that so how many partners or how is it broken down to you so Kagure who I traveled with to Senegal is my co-founder that was the person who when we were starting actually until June when we were running around trying to find a location mm-hmm. she was the person who we were working on this idea with when we were not very clear even on the, what the exact idea was yeah. so she's my co-founder and then we have other Lava Latte partners who is, so we have our creative partner who is my brother Ian and then we have our managing partner who is Leah mm-hmm. Other than finding the location, Mm -hmm. we hadn't found a managing partner who we felt comfortable with. And so there was a lot of, we need someone who would be comfortable being our partner in this business, but also we feel that the person will be here all day, every day, probably for the first couple of months before you even figure out your off days. We hadn't found someone who we felt comfortable with. So literally, when we did, it was in the same week where we decided to reconsider the location mm. and had the conversation about Leah and literally when those two things were locked in that week we're like I think we'll be comfortable opening in the next three months okay yeah what is a managing partner and a creative partner in this sense so our creative partner um like our brand identity the, our logo designs mm-hmm. we I keep getting comments on like our amazing flyers that we have for all the yes, events that we do beautiful. our staff uniforms mm. menus our website mm. our you know all of all of the actual design I, maybe I don't have the real proper words for the industry yeah. but like the graphic design mm-hmm. stuff that but also like understanding the whole brand and being mm-hmm. able to like now implement that in all the different ways that we you know we represent our brand mm-hmm. so yeah does that does all of that and he did all of you know before we had a different name before we opened you know it wasn't Lava Latte so even when we were thinking through those initially he was mm-hmm. the one who was kind of guiding us to think now we're going to represent the brand mm-hmm. and then the managing partner is she's both like the the general manager of the okay. business so okay. it's the day to day running the managing of the staff the managing of our suppliers mm-hmm. Because she's like the big boss of Lava Latte, like <laughs> okay. you know, okay. you know. So yeah. it's, things run. Because things run there. because she's there. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, and I've heard horror stories about partnerships. Yeah, what did you consider early on um, to put in place to ensure that this partnership um, between all four of you works out as smoothly as possible to the benefit of the business? Did you think about that a lot? Or? Ian is very specially skilled in a very set yes. thing. Yeah. But like, it was more like our personalities and our idea on what, you know, you're all sold on the vision mm-hmm. and you're all willing to do the work to make the vision come through. And then we started kind of honing it as we went along. Mm-hmm. Initially, there was just like a lot of work. None of us were from this industry. Yeah. Yes, your role is the managing partner and your role is managing the finances and your role is marked. But then it's just like, you're still we're doing everything. <laughs> we're trying to find a chef. We're all learning how to barista. It's, everyone is doing everything. Yeah. Ian is supposed to be doing creative. You're the one who's... <laughs> You're doing whatever needs to be done, exactly, you know? Yeah. So that's how it was for a couple of months. Mm-hmm. And then after a while, you know, once the craziness kind of started settling down, soon is when we kind of designated and put checks for who is in charge of what. Everyone knows that their inputs are valued mm-hmm. and are hard, mm-hmm. but also like understanding like in certain set things, we don't all have to be the one who are deciding ah. on this exact thing. But let's say I was in charge of the marketing. Yeah. If there's a certain decision to a certain point, you know, where there's an impasse, we agree that, yeah. you know, I'm the, the the final decision is going to end up with me and we all just respect that. Yeah. There is, there was some luck in it that we all knew each other. And trust each other. Trust and each and other. have integrity. <laughs> that, so that, that was literally, so even when you're saying, how did you select, it was lit, that was literally it. It was just like, do you understand what you're trying to do and do I trust you and that was it and I think that's been very beneficial and I can't you know overemphasize the especially the base integrity yes 
is really the you know because we haven't reached the point where we have all these checks and balances and mm-hmm. airtight systems that will make sure that everyone follows what they need to do to the T mm-hmm. but there's just a lot of openness and a lot of trust and you know integrity and as we grow then we add those checks yeah. as we go along mm-hmm. but well. yeah it's just a relationship of trust yeah a relationship yeah. of trust which is not something you see often it's really not yeah. it's really not yeah most businesses that are set up end up failing yes and i remember talking to a friend of mine one time and they're like you know cuz i i i am i'm in, i i love doing the lava latte work i love owning a coffee shop and they're just like if this was to fall through do you think you would you be interested in like like now that you've learned all that you've learned now would you mm-hmm. set up something like this like, and i was like you know i have learned a ton yes. and i have learned a ton in the industry and i would probably be interested in that but i also just like i can't like a big reason of the, that we are able to even get where we are mm-hmm. is because of this team of four mm-hmm. slash five people let's say our head chef you know mm-hmm. even though i have all this knowledge i can't replicate what we have if i didn't have like this team some but mm-hmm. with this exact team if this was to fail and we're like okay let's go into i don't know yeah we're figuring out how to get to Mars like yeah. i feel like these are people if we have someone who has the skills necessary it's like the right group of people that i would do something yeah. completely different with so again so serendipity and luck is a big part of it and then also in terms of how it all worked out cuz it could have it is and i feel like people don't like acknowledging that when things yeah. work out you yeah. want it all to be just it I was our brains it. and our i mean <laughs> it was luck but it was a team of people who are very yeah. like skilled yeah. and good at what they do yeah. but i mean Okay, so Kagurele and I, yes, it's luck, but also we're part of the same, like, women's fraternity, Zawadi Africa. Mm-hmm. So the un- we had been in a space where we could access each other. Yeah. But, you know, Lea, Lea, Lea was, like, quite a few years younger than us in university, so I, w- I didn't know her well until mm-hmm. this whole project was starting. Mm-hmm. But, you know, everyone else has probably, like, siblings and friends and whoever and networks who... I think, I think you can know someone is good at something and then it's different working with them. Completely different. And I feel like we could tell from the beginning, we could tell that we chanced on something that worked out. Worked out. Yeah. And you can so, tell when something is ifish. Yeah. Pretty early on. Yeah. And that's not to mean that we don't ever have disagreements or like but like even the fact that we worked through that so for a year I'm proud of this team, yeah, honestly. Congratulations. Yeah, congratulations. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, it's, God forbid, but you talked about, like, the friend saying, like, if this didn't work out, do you guys have things in place for, like, if this didn't work out, this is what happens? Is, you know, or... Oh, we're kind of not allowing it to not work out okay. at this point. <laughs> yeah. But I guess at this stage, we don't really have exactly, like, if... Or, like, ways that what you're is... protecting each other do you have contracts like what do you have oh yeah. okay yeah. yeah so there's contracts so you know the working contracts but also i guess the legal agreements of the share splits mm-hmm. and all of that but like i mean if it was a total fail then it means no one is getting anything out of it <laughs> but uh, i guess it's also what what does failure mean like if yeah. we make losses for the next year is that considered failure no so now like even right now we are going through a very kind of tight time mm-hmm. but it's because we've expanded into a new space that hadn't been like in our plan that early on mm-hmm. and so i don't i i don't know i don't even know if i could consider whatever which way the whole project goes a mm-hmm. failure mm-hmm. at this point having created this for the city yeah a place where people congregate have a good time they like being there they like the food we love we've learned so much we love working there mm-hmm. it's just like i at this point even if everything was to end at this point i would yeah. still consider it a success you talked about how none of you had experience in sort of food beverage and restaurant business Um the podcast is called I have no idea what I'm doing. Oh man, that's what our uh, we should be called actually. <laughs> cafe. Uh, <laughs> that's what I have no idea what I'm cafe. Um and so what did you do to prepare knowing that you didn't know much about the space? And then the second question I have for that is what do you wish you had done to prepare to prepare at the time? Mm. I think the good thing about being quote and quote so clueless what it did was make us very open to not like everyone who's harping on the ideas but seeking out people who are aware and being very open to feedback and that i think that 
uh, culture has kind of extended now just as how our lava latte is run like customer feedback is so like we are very willing to listen and mm-hmm take on advice from mm-hmm. other people. So I think that was really big in the beginning. So it was just like reaching out to other networks that we have who have been in the industry when it came from even like sourcing equipment. Mm-hmm. You know, it was everything, you know, which which are the, you know, baristas, let's find our barista friends who will advise us on yeah. which coffee roasters to consider. And then just being open and checking so reading a lot we also like were just online reading about all of the all of the things americans have been saying about coffee shops yes, since the and, beginning of yeah, time and just researching, researching, yeah. researching yeah even though we were not clued in in the industry per se i think it helped especially kagure Le and i all went to undergrad in america mm-hmm. and so we'd interacted with the coffee shop culture a ton mm-hmm. and so we knew what we wanted it to look like on yeah. the other side mm-hmm. so we just didn't know the exact steps to get there mm-hmm. I wish we had okay from the get uh I wish we'd set aside more time and also seeked out maybe more skilled guidance on like building our team not like this team of like our staffing team yeah human resources there's a reason why companies spend all this time energy in training and recruitment and I wish we'd taken in also research on that and mm-hmm. maybe seek some assistance in that process yeah. but we've figured it out as we go along now we've built our team a lot more yeah. we've had to add and let go some people but like that would have especially for the first couple of months I yeah. think the teething problems would have been a lot less if we set aside more yeah. time for that and speaking of like being creative in terms of like resourcing for staff I think you found your chef on Twitter yeah, so that was I was the HR director for a quick week over there and it was all being done on social media. <laughs> literally I had like three hundred CVs and <laughs> so, so Iko Kazi K I'm literally yeah, at lunchtime during yeah. my lunch break at work I'm just like Iko Kazi K okay, okay. Yeah. I, which I didn't the first time I did the call out, like putting my personal email I didn't even think about what that would mean. Yeah. Reach it's great people. and it's kind of terrible that there's literally a yeah. huge mass of people who are unemployed and looking for work. So mm-hmm. they're going to they're all looking yeah, for opportunities yeah yeah but also it's so great that like in can you can i need to hashtag eco kazike and like tag one group and it'll be retweeted 500 times and i'll get not our head chef came from we got a bunch of people off of and even now even now as i'm saying we're, there's maybe two people who someone else has recommended but when that doesn't work it's always just like okay let's go to twitter okay yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. with the restaurant industry yeah what's the hardest thing about it that people don't realize because I think we all like to think we'd be able to open something yeah what was the one thing that people just really don't realize that's really difficult about it getting people who are willing to learn and adapt and grow with you is really really difficult yeah. um, but also just managing the being able to get really granular in the processes to be able to be very clear on like how much are you wasting and how much are you actually making you make money at the end of the month and mm-hmm. you pay all these expenses but to get very granular to be able to grow and to be able to be clear on how you're pricing because mm-hmm. before you're big enough to have like very clear systems in your kitchen it's all very Let's mashed it together out, yeah. yeah so yeah that's yeah, that's a process that's taking quite a bit of time for us. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you are in the restaurant business and in the US it's known to be predominantly male. I think it's the same here yeah. as well. Yeah. And so and you guys are fully sort of female owned yeah. restaurant. Do you run into sort of situations of like where men are trying to it because also this ageism and assert then, their manness yes, too much. To, on the business and on, <laughs> on you guys. Business, yeah. yeah. It's not been like over so we've created a space also where like we've hired majority it's a mostly a women's team. We have like very two men. Mm-hmm. Uh, but so it's you know, it's a women it's a space that's mostly full of women. But like even just like handling with our some of our suppliers mm-hmm. or any other people in the industry we need actually <laughs> government people. Mm-hmm. There's more of the Sometimes there's little, it's yeah, like, little, these little girls, you know, mm-hmm. they're very little girl attitude. <laughs> so, which sometimes it's like they don't take you seriously because of that. And so, that in some situations, <laughs> it's made us like get away with 
some things but like they, they just it's you're just not taken as seriously so it's mm-hmm. just like there's not a lot of respect so it's just, but we don't like i don't know it's from as little as even like let's say the people building your furnishings you can tell that if it was because it's this little girl who's mm-hmm. harassing it's not as it's not as urgent it's not as serious mm-hmm. but i guess once you interact over time that always yeah. flips yeah the path of least, least resistance sometimes is the one to be taken and yeah. it's just like I'm not going to be fighting every and then also sometimes even like the client base there's some there's going to be some uh, older men who come in and you can t- you know they they feel like they should they instruct you on how you should be running your business they know they know nothing about what you do in Lava Latte yeah. they're not even from the industry they're not <laughs> but you know you literally you'll be sat down for two hours and someone who's telling you what they think you need to be doing and you can you know as a customer as a customer uh, telling you why your prices do, what you need to be adjusting on your prices and why this doesn't make sense and, mm-hmm. da, 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 and where you should be set up and mm-hmm. and a majority of the times when you get that kind of a situation it's almost always a man it's mm-hmm. like 90% of the time that that happens you know mm-hmm. it's just carving a space where either avoiding those interactions yeah um uh, making it clear what our stances are on things. So if it's someone who you can't have a base relationship of respect, then we don't need to continue this relationship. Right. And the outcome of our work speaks for itself. So eventually mm-hmm. they buck off. So, mm-hmm. yeah. And I think you're the first person I've talked to who actually does have... I'm not sure what you did in undergrad, but I know you have an MBA. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so how has the Lava Latte benefited from your MBA? Huh. Can we say how life would have panned out? I mean, <laughs> our path is as it has gone. Yeah. Um, do I think it's necessary to have an MBA to be able to set up a business? No. Yeah. Uh, was there some benefit from my MBA for the business? A hundred percent. Yeah. In what ways? So even in the super, super early stages, when we we're just kind of thinking not even all, both of us yet. I just I, I wanted to like structure what the idea of this coffee shop even looks like. Mm-hmm. Putting it down on paper, it literally started as like uh, one of my class assignments, mm-hmm. and being able to like present it and get feedback on some of the things and talk to my professor through some of it. That also helped me think, kind of, of the whole project hol- holistically, which was very helpful. Mm-hmm. A lava latte was like a school assignment for yeah. me, honestly. <laughs> that worked out. Yeah, yeah, with like two of, there's two very key professors who, you know, uh, they shared a lot of feedback and just share sharing it with people who I know have a very diverse background and then being able to kind of, you know, chip in their, you know, different suggestions of things. I think that was helpful, but it provided me a wider network of the kind of people I needed access to. Mm-hmm. So I guess a big thing is maybe focusing on accessing that network it might be through an MBA it might be through whatever your career is or just Mm -hmm. friendships and relationships but Mm -hmm. having people who can be a diverse group of people who are good sounding boards but also you who you can trust their yeah feedback on things yeah I like that yeah thank you um you'd sort of hinted uh at multiple lava lattes, kind of. 50 million branches, I said, to be specific. Okay, Mm -hmm. Uh, So please tell us what the goals are for the cafe. Yeah. Yeah. So we would like lava latte to be a chain. Mm -hmm. That is the picture of success for us. Mm -hmm. So this is like kind of our pilot space. Once Mm. we... Once you get that lock down. all of that down, mm-hmm. then we're going to because we don't want to like expand inefficiencies to yeah. other spaces. Yeah. So that's what we are kind of buckling down to do now, and it's good that we're doing it in a bigger space because it's way more representative of what another outlet would look like. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, but ideally, we'd like a couple more lavalatis in this city and then around the country, and then who knows. Around East Africa, yeah, Africa. Yeah, we have listeners in Af- all of Africa. You, you know, know La- maybe La- we'll partner La- with Layu La- La- and have Layu's <laughs> Lava Latte Senegal. Yes. Yeah. Yes, so. sky's the limit. Sky's the limit. But that, that would be ideal. I think it would just be really cool to have, like, a women-owned local coffee shop that, like, mm. grows to that scale. So, yeah. Yeah, from your lips to God's ears. Eh? No. Inshallah. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you. This was a really great conversation. So much wisdom shared. Thank oh, you. Because you know I learned about Lava Latte early on. Mm-hmm. And it's just been fun, even from far away, seeing mm-hmm. you guys mm-hmm. 
grow in your identity, grow in space, mm. uh, grow in audience and customers. So like kudos to you guys. You're really onto something. Thank you so much. Thanks again, Abba. This interview was recorded last year, and so I have a quick update for you on Lava Latte. Like many businesses, the cafe had to close in Nairobi during the height of the COVID lockdown. But they are back and they're really making sure to implement precautions for COVID-19. So I ask that if you're feeling the urge for a coffee, for a good time, go ahead and support this boutique coffee shop. All the information about Lava Latte, its social media, website, and anything that ABBA referenced is in the show notes, so check those out. There's also a podcast extra clip that I'll be sharing with the Facebook group from this interview. And it's a clip where ABBA talks about what she does to achieve work-life balance. So you can join the Facebook group um, in order to access that. It's exclusive to that. And the link for that is in the show notes. Lastly, I have been getting quite a few messages from people asking how they can be on the podcast or if they can recommend a friend to be on the podcast. I am very happy to take recommendations. So what I've done is I've created a form that you can fill out for yourself or anyone you want to recommend. And I will then take a look at whatever you share with me. So the link for that form is also um, in the show notes. So end of the month, let's finish strong. I'll see you next week. So be it, see to it.